This is the Farm Monitor. For over 50 years, your source for agribusiness news and features from around the southeast and across the country. Focusing on one of the nation's top industries, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by one of the largest general farm organizations, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. All right, ready or not, here we go. Thanks for tuning into the show. Kenny B off this week for social distancing purposes, but that's the only bad part of the show. Everything else is really good. Coming up, they're one of Georgia's most coveted fruits. Talking, of course, about peaches. We'll check in with a middle Georgia producer to see how Peach Harvest 2020 is shaping up. Also on the program, downtown Roberta gets a facelift of sorts. Just a small one, actually, but the impact this special project is having on the community is a rather large one. And then later, if you're struggling with your current landscape project, don't sweat it. Help is as easy as taking a few pictures and hitting send. These stories and so much more start right now on the Farm Monitor. With its distinct sweet flavor, few things can beat a Georgia peach. I mean, people will drive for hours even across state lines to get their hands on some. And despite a less than ideal growing season, this year's crop appears to have plenty of quality and more importantly, quantity. Damon Jones has the story. Nothing says springtime in Georgia quite like the state's signature fruit. And consumers will be happy to know that harvest is now in full swing on a peach crop that is sure to satisfy their demands. Peaches are looking good. I mean, we're all, it's always good when you ride, ride down the road this time of year and you can see peaches on the tree, whether they're green or whether they're red, you know. Uh, we're always fighting cold weather and, and other weather events. So the fact that we made it through our cold in March and April, you know, we're, we're really happy. Looks really good. Um, we, we're having um, good bricks. Uh, peaches taste great. And um, they're, they've suffered through an a interesting winter and an interesting spring, but at the end of the day, it's a, it's a Georgia peach and it's fantastic. While unpredictable weather conditions were a cause for concern during growing season, avoiding a late cold snap after blooming provided maximum yield on this year's crop. We had May weather in March, and we're having March weather in May. Um, so it's, it's been a difficult spring for the trees, which is odd, um, but we didn't have a freeze. So as long as we don't have a freeze, we set fruit and it, it, uh, we, can, we can make peaches. I mean, we've, I, I think we've had, we've had a late freeze or a, a March freeze probably four out of the last five years. So just having that freeze in, in late February was really nice. As for the all important chill hours, almost all of the peaches got the minimum requirement despite a warmer than normal winter. Most Fridays got enough. We were maybe a little marginal on our real high chillers, but um, for, for the most part, you know, we bloomed well. We came out with leaves. Leaves came on right after bloom. So, I mean, we had a really good bloom. It's been a really clean crop. You know, we've not seen any bacterial spot for, to amount to much in, in many, most places. Uh, so really, it's been a good looking year, even though we had so much rain in, you know, March and April. With the growers now heading down the home stretch, they're looking for temperatures to rise in order to enhance the flavor before picking. Uh, we need we need peaches to have a little bit of heat so they can get sweet and uh, and swell up and come on when we need them to, um, and it's you know normally that's right now 85 to 90 degrees and um, yesterday afternoon it was 56 so that's not it's just slowing everything down um, so we need to get a little bit warm but not too hot. Of course, harvest season can't take place without the labor force, which fortunately wasn't a problem despite the pandemic. It has in thing, precautions that we're taking, but we really had no problems um, with our people coming in and, and getting enough uh, of our contract laborers to get here. And despite the slowing economy, the demand for peaches appears to not have been greatly affected. It, it's looking really good right now. Um, we have a, a good crop. We're always worried about uh, finding enough homes for it, but right now the grocery store sales have been up. Um, we don't typically run a whole lot of peaches through food service because they're so um, perishable. Um, it's a real tight time, tight timeline, and right now all the demand has been, uh, I would say, better than better than usual. Reporting from Peach County, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. In other ag news, EPA Administrator Andrew Wheeler making a stop in Henry County recently in what he called his first trip outside of Washington D.C. since the COVID-19 outbreak. Wheeler toured Southern Bell Farm and spoke to a group of approximately 75 people consisting of state government officials as well as Georgia Farm Bureau members. He told the monitor events like these are crucial in working towards a better relationship between the ag community and EPA. Well, it's absolutely important. I don't know what's on their mind if I don't get out and talk to them. 
and that's why I enjoy getting out into the field. I've talked with different farm groups all around the country, and it's it's really important for me to learn what's first and foremost on their minds. What a tragedy when you the first time you meet somebody is when there's a problem, and so. Having these types of relation building, uh, relationship building activities where you can get to know people, get to understand them, make sure that you have the right email, and those kind of just basic uh, components of communication, that's so important, particularly with environmental uh, uh, regulation. All right, moving on now in the world of agriculture, June is typically celebrated as Dairy Month. And to mark the occasion, the monitor sought out the expertise of a dietitian to explain the benefits of dairy in the diet and just how beneficial it is to our health and well-being. Here's John Holcomb. Each and every day, milk producers all over the country get up and get to work milking their cows to make sure there is a constant supply of milk and dairy products. But in recent years, people have started neglecting those products for a number of different reasons, which is where the Dairy Alliance and Lanier de Bruzzi comes in. The Dairy Alliance is a nonprofit uh, dairy association, and we work on behalf of the dairy farmers of the Southeast. As a registered dietitian with the Dairy Alliance, I help educate and promote the health benefits of dairy in the diet. According to DeBruzzi, Americans are neglecting their health and well being, and oftentimes the things that are missing can be found in dairy products, or at least can be achieved by mixing dairy with other foods. Most Americans are not getting four key nutrients in their diet calcium, potassium, vitamin D, and fiber. Including dairy foods in your diet helps you get three of those four nutrients, calcium, vitamin D, and potassium. And what do you eat with dairy foods? It's cereal and milk, it's apple and a cheese. So including dairy foods in your diet actually helps you get that fourth nutrient that we're not getting enough of. And we know these nutrients are important because research has shown that including these nutrients in our diets in adequate amount help decrease the risk for chronic diseases like heart disease, diabetes, obesity, and even some kinds of cancers. The shift from dairy can be traced to a number of different things, whether it be myths, lactose intolerance, or perhaps the most popular plant-based milk alternatives, which many thinks is a healthier choice, but DeBruzzi says otherwise. So if you look at the ingredients label of cow's milk, it's milk, vitamin A, and vitamin D. If you look at the ingredient labels of the other milk alternatives, you're going to see a long list of ingredients, and many of them have added sugar as well. Sugar, many of us don't need extra of. We don't need more of it. Um, so it's a kind of hidden source of added sugar in our diet. Not to mention, unlike real milk, from glass to glass, you may not be getting exactly what you think from the alternatives. Between cow's milk and milk alternatives, there really is no comparison. The nutrition just does not stack up between cow's milk and the milk alternatives. You know, with every glass of real cow's milk, you know exactly the nutrition you're getting. And sometimes with these milk alternatives, you have to shake up that bottle because all of the added ingredients are settled at the bottom. So from glass to glass to glass, you really don't know the ingredients and the nutrition that you're getting. It's undoubtedly important to know what you're getting when consuming food which is why DeBruzzi is thankful Americans are more interested than ever about their diets and just wants people to know fact from fiction. You know, as a registered dietitian, I'm so excited because people are more interested than ever about their food and their health. And I am so thankful to serve our dairy farmers of the Southeast and answer questions that people have and be able to talk about the health benefits of dairy foods. And our, our website, thedairyalliance.com, is a great resource to go to if you have questions about farming, uh, questions about milk myths, and even recipes. We have delicious recipes for kids, we have lactose-free recipes, and recipes for the whole family. Reporting in Fulton County for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. After the break, a look back at Crawford County's rich agricultural history using some paints, some paint brushes, and a lot of creative teamwork, not to mention a wealth of artistic talent. We're still waking up every morning and we're putting our boots on and we're going to work and we're farming. That's all we know how to do. So we're going to continue to do that. We are going to continue to produce food enough for the entire country. It's far from business as usual in cities and towns across America. Over the last few weeks, you may have seen some empty shelves at your local grocery store. 
But we want you to know that America's farmers and ranchers are still farming, working diligently in their fields, barns, and orchards to continue feeding America today and tomorrow, just like we do 365 days a year. Farmers care, otherwise they wouldn't, they wouldn't go into the season totally unknowing if there's gonna be a 2021 season for them. I think they do that every year. Um, I think that's the salt of the earth, uh, good heart of people who grow food. We're proud to serve the men and women who treat their work as a calling, not a job. Of course, farmers can't do it alone. To all the farm suppliers and grocery store clerks, thank you. We do not take you for granted. Resiliency is part of farming, and believing in tomorrow is core to a farmer's creed. We are all in this together. The Coronavirus Food Assistance Program, an aid package applauded by American Farm Bureau Federation. Farmers can now enroll in the program by contacting their local farm service agency office. AFBF economist Shelby Myers explains how the payments will be calculated for non-specialty crops and for livestock. The livestock payment rate is calculated by taking the number of livestock sold between January 15th and April 15th of 2020, multiplied by the CARES Part 1 payment rate, plus the inventory of livestock held April 16th to May 14th of 2020, multiplied by the CCC Part 2 payment rate. To qualify for a payment, a commodity must have declined in price by at least 5% between mid-January to mid-April of 2020 due to the coronavirus, and it will come as a single payment. To ensure the availability of fund, producers will receive 80% of their maximum total payment upon approval of their application, and the remaining 20% that does not exceed the payment limit will be paid at a later date. For those who qualify, they should receive their payment 7 to 10 days after their application is approved. Well, for some, it can be difficult to pronounce. Rural murals. But if a picture, or in this case a painting, is worth a thousand words, then there's no pronunciation needed. All you have to do is look, admire, and reflect on the past. Created by Flint Energies, the Rural Murals Project is a means to help rejuvenate rural downtown areas. We were there as artist Chris Johnson put the finishing touches on his masterpiece in Crawford County. Our Rural Murals Project is a creative way to uh, interject or uh, impact communities through economic development, a creative economic development initiative. Um, we started this uh, last year in 2019 with our first mural um, award winner in Oglethorpe, and this is our second mural um, project. And uh, the project is mainly to um, beautify um, uh, our downtown areas and our rural communities, uh, instill some pride in those communities and sort of be the instigator or the catalyst to um, invest back in those downtown areas. So maybe just on the surface, you know, a mural is just a painting, but, but I think for a community it is representative of kind of um, who we are based off of where we've been and where we came from. And so, yeah, I think it's something um, that a community can unite around. You know, we can unite around needs, we can u unite around causes, and, and I think we can unite around artwork that depicts who we are and where we came from. I've been doing this for about three years and I've been all over southwest Georgia painting all these small towns that look like Roberta and I've always wanted to come back here and do some beautification and revitalization and get some work on the wall so whenever I got um, contacted about being a part of this project it was really exciting. I could come back home and uh, make some paintings for all my friends and relatives and family members to see. I do a lot of research about the communities. A lot of people know that they want a mural and they know they want something bright and beautiful and colorful. They may even know kind of what they want to focus on or what the content's going to be. Um, however, the, they might not have a background in design or painting or know how to get the process done. So um, 
They provide a structure or some outline of what they're looking for and I kind of flush it out. A lot of research goes into it, but I enjoy doing that. I enjoy reading and it makes it a, a you more part of the project whenever you know about the the community that you're going to paint in and then you make a, a project for that. So, um, You know, we start with Dickey Farms. Um, everybody in Roberta grew up going to Dickey Farms, you know, and still now today our kids enjoy um, going there, eating ice cream, peaches. It's just kind of um, something that's always been part of our community. You know, and I think about um, the mules and the crops there and we think about um, just farming, me as a farmer, you know, where we've evolved from, where we've come from, just to think that, that there really were people in our community, farmers from years ago, that literally spent days plowing and planting behind mules. And I, and I think about how, um, I tell people all the time, you know, that I sit, under sh in the, I sit in the shade of trees that other people planted. You know, I get to stand on foundations that people laid way before my time. And so as a farmer, when I see those mules, I think about, so many years ago that you know there was somebody that literally farmed the way I do every day but they did it maybe a lot lot tougher and, and maybe through even some you know greater hardships or what whatnot than uh than we we can experience and then of course the old courthouse um you know such an iconic part of our community um the pottery is is something that goes way back you know with us the old farm all tractor there you know just that it it to me, this mural with, with everything on it just reminds us of the farming background that we do have in Roberta, and I'm so thankful and proud um, that our community still um, leans a lot on agriculture and, and proud to be a part of that. It's exciting to know that they've, it has uh, accomplished its goal with helping people look at blank walls and um, assess a need for revitalization, and it's great to be a part of that, and I'm glad that uh, I have a skill set that allows me to be part of that. Yeah, it turned out really nice, didn't it? And hey, don't forget, if you missed any part of the story or others on today's program, you can still see them in their entirety at our YouTube channel. And while you're there, keep clicking like the Farm Monitor Facebook page. Also, if you have a story idea or if you just want to leave us a comment or suggestion, send us a message either on Facebook or at the address on your screen. That is news at farm-monitor.com. Well, now that it's gardening and landscape season, you may come across some issues like unidentified pests or even plants dying off. But if that's the case, we've got a simple solution that's only a click away. Extension Corner with Paul Pugliese, when the Farm Monitor continues. They're out there on the front lines. The brave, the dedicated, the relentless. But there's another front line. The one that helps nourish all others while facing epic struggles of their own. So in this season of uncertainty, a few things remain certain. The rain will fall, the sun will shine, and together we'll continue to grow. Hi, I'm Paul Puglis with the University of Georgia Cooperative Extension. Today I want to share with you some ways that you can take advantage of the services that we have through your local county extension office as far as troubleshooting problems in your landscape. There are a lot of things that you can submit to us through digital pictures and images uh, over the internet, either through email or uh, by texting to your local county extension office. You can take pictures of weeds that you need identified in your landscape, insects that you might find in your garden, and even disease samples of plants that are having problems that are sick with diseases such as viruses or fungi or other problems. 
So when you take a sample, it's very important that you take a good sample and make sure that you're actually taking it in a way that you can photograph it with a background that's usually white or neutral so that you can get a good image. Um, the best types of samples are big samples. The bigger you can get it, the better, especially with flowers. Flowers are one of the most important identifying features for being able to identify weeds. Uh, for grasses, if you're looking at grasses, the seed head on that grass is very important as far as identification as well. With disease samples, you want to make a good sample that has a range of symptoms that are both healthy and diseased on the same branch. And that'll make it easier to help identify if it is a disease or if it's something that's spreading and whether or not you need to do something about it. So when you're taking your pictures, make sure that you uh, have a camera with a wide angle. Uh, it can be a digital camera or even a phone or iPad. Uh, the technology we have today works very, very well. And so you want to zoom in like this. And of course, you know there's a zoom feature here where you can, you can get really close. And I would suggest taking two or three different images, maybe some close-ups of the seed heads or the flower. Um, and again, with that white background, it really makes it stand out. Make sure you get it in focus and take several images that you can email. With, picture, with uh, insects, uh, it's a lot easier to film insects or take pictures of insects when they're already dead. Uh, so the best way to take a dead picture or a picture of a dead insect um, is to take some alcohol, put it in a jar, and sedate that insect before you take a picture of it and then lay it out and dry it. And then you can get a nice close-up picture of that insect um, in, your, in your view here. And then uh, for disease samples, again, you want to get sort of the whole branch. I would suggest getting a, a picture of the whole branch and then maybe some close-up pictures as well of the symptoms that you're seeing. One other thing that can be helpful for, tr for troubleshooting uh, problems in the landscape is a landscape shot. So if you could, sometimes it's better to get a picture of the, of the whole tree um, and what's going on in the landscape behind it. Because a lot of problems have to do with the environment. Maybe too much water, poor drainage, too much sun, too much shade. And so send me a landscape shot as well as the close-ups that you're seeing of the disease or the insect that you're having problems with. And again, this is a quick and easy way to get uh, information and troubleshooting through your local county extension office. Some information you want to submit with that is the name of the plant that you found it on, how big the problem is, is it affecting multiple plants in the landscape, how long have you been seeing it, and how many plants are actually affected. Those are some basic things you need to include in that email or that text that you send to your local county extension office. And the great thing about this is we can return a phone call usually the very next day a lot quicker than you bringing us a sample um, or you know, having to uh, schedule a site visit uh, to come out and see you in, in your landscape. So for more information, contact your local county extension office. And you can also go to our local website at ugaextension.org. Look up your local county extension office and get their contact information to submit samples by email. And also, you can continue to follow us on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Well, finally this week, all of us here at the Monitor would like to send a huge congratulations out to Marsha Calloway, who is the wife of Georgia Beef Commission Chairman John Calloway. Marsha, now the newest member of the Georgia Cattle Women's Hall of Fame after being inducted on May 28th. Her list of accomplishments, too many to rattle off, but just a few highlights worth mentioning. Marsha's taught many 4-H club programs and spent countless hours working with Georgia's youth and helping them develop their showmanship skills with livestock. She also served two years as the Georgia Cattlewomen's Association president, and she is a fighter. Since January, Marsha has been undergoing treatments for cancer, so we certainly wish her the best and send thoughts and prayers as she continues her courageous battle. Unfortunately, we are out of time, but before we leave you, a quick reminder that for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening down on the farm, be sure you check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You will stay informed and you'll see what's up in the world of farming and with us here at the show. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next week right here on the Farm Monitor. Be safe.